Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us today. We'll uh, get started. More people will be Zooming in, I'm sure. I'm Lauren Kuby with the Stardust Center for Affordable Homes and the Family at ASU. And Stardust it seeks to connect the dots among housing, how, housing, health, food access, and transportation, even shade, uh, to help craft regional integrated solutions leading to healthy, happy communities. It's my honor today to introduce Deirdre Pfeiffer. She'll be our moderator. She's an associate professor for the ASU School of Geographical Sciences and Urban Planning. And she's also a housing planning scholar with expertise on housing as a cause and effect of growing social inequity and inequality and the role of housing planning in meeting the needs of diverse social groups. Deirdre, take it away. Thanks, Lauren. Well, I am delighted to welcome our speaker. So Jason Corburn is a professor of urban planning and public health at the University of California, Berkeley. His new book, Cities for Life, investigates communities that are working to heal from trauma, everything from gun violence to housing and food insecurity and poverty. Today, Jason will talk about how cities can confront discriminatory, exclusionary, and racist urban institutions, and instead promote healing-focused practices. Before we begin, just a reminder to you, members of the audience, please enter your questions into the Q&A feature at any time, and Lauren will be feeding them to me, and we'll get to as many questions as possible. So without further ado, Jason, go ahead, take it away. Okay. Thank you, Lauren and Deidre and ASU and Island Press for putting all this together. Really, really happy to be here or at least virtually with you. Uh, let's see if I can, okay. Um, hopefully you can see that I'm advancing the slide. Uh, so what I wanna talk about today, obviously is as Deidre mentioned this new book and, and, and this work really came out of over 10 years of collaboration in three different cities. I didn't start out as a book. It didn't even start out as a research project specifically around trauma and recovery and healing. And I'll talk more about that in, 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 the, in the talk this, uh, this afternoon. But um, really what I found is that city planning and, and policies or often lack of planning and policy has created physical and social traumas in many of our communities. And these traumas, it can be in the built environment and in social environment, social dynamics, and often those things interact, really create what we call chronic or toxic stress. And this is the kind of stress that's not that everyday stress, I've got a final next week, but really that chronic stress that wears away at the body, our immune system, our brain development, and leads to the leading causes of uh, disease and death uh, in the United States and globally. Uh, but of course, that stress is not equally distributed that the poor, poor, urban poor often, uh, black, indigenous folks of color, most harmed. Um, and community-driven assessments and solutions I've found, and I'll talk more about that, are necessary to understand both these stressors, but more importantly in my work to mitigate them. How do we move towards action? Uh, and what do these partnerships really look like and how can they lead to more sustainable, healthy, and equitable outcomes for everyone? So as I said, and I, I think maybe these seminars really focusing on how cities and urban life can be healthy for us. And they often promote the social determinants of health, economic and educational opportunities, access to goods and services, cultural expression, uh, access to hopefully good care and treatment. So we're seeing today during the, the pandemic the inequities across space and place, um, and also positive social interactions, those social connections that keep us healthy. But those benefits really matter where you live in a city. Is it segregated? Uh, like this in community here in Sao Paulo in Brazil where the favela on the left um, really serves the wealthy on the right, right? They clean the houses and take care of the pools of those folks. Uh, so how that city is planned or how it's governed really matters about who's gonna benefit um, and who's gonna be harmed in a city. And the relationship between our built and social environments and our stress is not a new idea. And this is work that goes back decades, really. This report, um, which had multiple iterations from the Institute of Medicine, from neurons to neighborhoods, really highlighted how toxic stress damages young people's development uh, early on in life, and then sets you up for disease uh, and maybe early death uh, as you age. And that toxic stress is, like I said, really a function of multiple insults happening at the same time, sometimes in utero and as we age. And those insults result in a constant release of stress hormones, 
cortisol and adrenaline and others. And this leads to biologic changes in our, in our bodies. So often we're not aware of, and also in our brains, um, internal inflammation. So that arterial plaque, that cholesterol is not necessarily linked to just your diet, but it's actually to stress. Uh, and obesity and overweight is not just exercise, but it's the stress that some populations are facing across their life for, lifetime that leads to that fat accumulation, diabetes and heart disease, many, many again of the leading killers linked back to stress. But those stressors of course are also in our communities, they're in our neighborhoods. Uh, they're, they're the traumas from our built and social environment. So they, they don't happen by accident. Uh, and they also influence our gene expression. So the idea of epigenetics, are, we, are our genes gonna be expressed in the way that we might be programmed to can often be influenced by these levels of stress. Whoops, okay. Um, yeah, sorry about that. So, so this is sort of uh, uh, one of the images in the book about these multiple stressors in our, in our urban neighborhoods and how they have multiple impacts. So too often in public health or urban planning or public policy, we're focused on one of these at a time. And the, 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 the limit of that is that you know, people are exposed to multiple stressors, multiple traumas at a time. Um, and they don't live their life, uh, you know, housing insecure one day or lack of transportation the next or food insecure or exposed to violence or environmental pollution um, a third day. It happens simultaneously, but our policies and our plans and our approaches are not reflecting the lived reality of many communities. And that trauma is really what people like Bessel van der Kolk in a wonderful book called The Body Keeps the Scores really said is ought to be the focus of our work in public policy and particularly in public health, that we can't continue to treat people and send them back into the conditions that are making them sick and stressed in the first place, nor can we just focus on individuals, people, without also focusing on changing the context within which they live, and that's the importance of public policies. Uh, and the really powerful thing that improving social connection, social cohesion, healthy social relationships can have a greater health benefit according to much, much research than changing our diet, stopping smoking and exercising combined. Now that's a pretty powerful statement. And so what my work really tries to do is, well, what can contribute to improving these social connections in cities and, and addressing these traumas and changing those conditions? And I'm gonna give you three brief examples uh, from my work in what seemed like really disparate places around the world, Nairobi, Kenya, Medellin, Colombia, and Richmond, California here, uh, just near where I am in, in, in uh, the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area. And I'll try to say something about the, the commonalities across these three places, but also how, and most importantly, that community residents have really identified the hazards and the traumas that they faced using action research and partnerships with uh, local government and other uh, community organizations to change those conditions. Let me start in Richmond. Um, so Richmond in the San Francisco Bay Area, this map on your right is showing life expectancy in 2005 and Richmond had the lowest life expectancy similar to places like East and West Oakland uh, in the Bay Area at that time. And it's a very industrial, largely immigrant city, also a uh, lot of activism community of color. And in 2007 was the ninth most violent city in the United States based on gun homicides. So a process started to that really was driven by activists to say, how could we create a more peaceful, healthy community? And one of the exercises they did was to kind of identify what were the stressors in their neighborhood and in their lives, but also what might reverse those, what might address those. Um, and these were done during sort of land use and public policy discussions. So it was a surprise that these kinds of dialogues were actually happening uh, among planners who weren't really familiar at the time with the relationship between say, uh, stress and traumas and health. And one of the outcomes, um, there's a lot more that happened before this outcome and you'll have to read the book to get all those details. But one of the outcomes, one of the recommendations was to create an office of peacemaking in city government. It's called the Office of Neighborhood Safety. It was one of the first in the United States. Now, I think there's a few dozen. Uh, and this was uh, a, a very innovative because one of the radical things was they wanted to hire formerly incarcerated uh, members of the community, felons who went away to prison, some for 
murder charges who've come back out of prison, uh, healed after serving many, many years to serve as city employees, to be street outreach workers, to keep peace in the streets. And they do that by focusing on the most uh, highly influential folks in a, in a neighborhood or in a community that are known or suspected of, of using guns and to reach out to them and engage them and recognize that they're often not just um, potential perpetrators, but also potential victims. And they are often living in neighborhoods uh, with insecure housing, insecure food, poor education, many, many of those stressors, poverty. And they enroll these young people in something called the Peacemaker Fellowship, which is an intensive 18 month mentorship program where they give them services and classes and opportunities to really help turn their lives around and uh, uh, change the conditions that they are living in and change their opportunities. And we've had amazing results, 55% reduction in gun homicides over less than a decade and assaults. And almost 150 of those fellows, those participants are alive and without gun arrests. This is Devon Bogan, the leader of that program with some of the fellows from the neighborhood. And this is James Houston, uh, one of the leader, leading street outreach workers who was from Richmond, served over 20 years in San Quentin prison, came back as a, a street outreach worker, what we call a neighborhood change agent, uh, really a street level healer, I consider him, a wounded healer. It's gone through his own healing and brings that now to young people. And this is what he had to say, that this program offers an ecosystem of harm reduction, attention, services, and opportunities and resources to those society has deemed expendable. We invest in them and see them as assets. It's about loving them up with the product of that love, a reduction in gun violence and a healthier community for all. So what's interesting about ONS, this, this violence reduction program is it really focuses on healing from the traumas that young people face and through that seeing them change in behavior and uh, violence. Of course, part of the Richmond work also had to change the places, the neighborhoods. This is a neighborhood called the Iron Triangle. Uh, in Richmond, where many, much of the violence was happening, the most violent community, the un, most unhealthy and poorest community, uh, like many others around the country and around the world. And similar young people came together and said, we want to take back this neighborhood. And one of the things they said was, we want to take this park in this neighborhood. It was called Elm Play Lot, which was overrun by drug dealers and homeless and just not safe. Even though it looked like this, you can see the boarded up housing in the background and was occupied and not uh, open to the community, wasn't a place that the community could utilize. And so they, they organized, and this is Tony Lee, a neighborhood resident who lived right next to Elm Playlot, organized her community uh, and surveyed them about what could they do to this park? How could they actually come together and do a collaborative design process? And that's exactly what they did is they came together over a number of years to uh, actually take the park from the city. They actually took the, 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 the land above the city to reprogram it and the city still holds the, the liability and the lease on the land, but they control the park. And they came up with a new vision uh, for Elm Playlot called their community vision. And look, that's what you see here on the left. And what was unique about them is that they didn't just come up with a plan and ask the city council or the state of California to implement it for them. They said, we'll actually build it. Uh, will you give us some of the money? We'll raise some of the money from foundations and we'll build it, we'll make it happen. And that's exactly what they did as you can see it here. And today they continue to build and maintain and program what happens at that park. So it's not just a place that people designed, which was important, but they have ownership over it because they work there, they get paid. They have a community kitchen, they have uh, give out food, they have all kinds of programmings for young people and adults. And it's really a place where people now come together uh, and you can see the housing has all been upgraded around this park and violence is way down. This is some data that we were able to collect over a 12 year period showing the improvements in self-rated health and people's perceptions of place to live. And in that Iron Triangle neighborhood, this change in people's uh, strength of friendships and associations in the neighborhood positively rating and trust with their neighbors and uh, a reduction in poverty from 28 to 19 percent of course this was before COVID and an increase of fifteen thousand dollars in median household income and importantly um, and not insignificantly a major drop in gun homicides uh, from 47 to 15 per hundred thousand uh, which has really changed the dynamic in this neighborhood and helped 
not just people heal, but also the community now getting development and getting opportunities to improve their place. Medellin, Colombia, second example in the book, um, a place also like Richmond, very violent and inequitable. And how did they change from probably you've heard one of the most violent cities in the world to now uh, in the 90s, the highest homicide rate to now uh, not even in the top 100. How did that happen and what did they do has been the focus of much media attention and they've won many, many awards. Uh, still not fully, I don't think people understand the complexities of how this happened, of how the city and community residents really came together to change the dynamics uh, in Medellin. And really it was led by community dialogues, people coming together in crisis of, of violence to say, how can we uh, replan? Uh, how can we come together? Mostly led by women and youth groups who were disproportionately impacted by violence in Medellin. Uh, and really a mayor, Sergio Fajardo, who really came up with this idea called social urbanism, which is an idea that if you're gonna plan and invest with new urban policies, they must focus on the poorest and most violent communities first with the most beautiful and functional projects, uh, both social programs and built environment changes, to what they call the ethics of aesthetics. And that's exactly what they did. You may have heard of Medellin's Metro Cable, Metro Cable, the first use of a ski lift uh, for its public transportation system. Many of the poor communities are on steep hillsides that are inaccessible to the rest of the fabric of the city. And this changed an hour and a half walking uh, down steep steps or you know roads without sidewalks to a 15 minute, 10 or 15 minute commute to get to uh, the, the metro, the, the other parts of the metro and, and jobs and shopping and other educational opportunities within uh, the other parts of the city. And another innovation that they came up was with using shopping mall escalators. They're electric escalators. And this is Comuna 13, Comuna uh, San Javier, which is also was the most violent neighborhood in Medellin. You can see the steep hillside. Again, free electric escalators to serve the community to uh, access schools, community centers, and the rest of the fabric of the transport system. But it was young people who also said, we need public space. We need new places to come together to heal from this violence. And one of the suggestions they came up with was to reclaim water tanks that were on the hillsides, storing water and open them up, take down the walls and fences and create new public spaces. And young people helped design them. The planning schools and architecture schools in Medellin had contests for students uh, to help redesign these. And they came up with very elaborate places for art and music and play and education and recreation and sports. And there's about 20 of these across the whole city, but the first ones and the most elaborate ones were invested in the most violent neighborhoods first and allowed for young people to, to define what practices would go on there. And this is uh, from one organization called Casa Colacho in uh, San Javier in Comuna Trece, uh, talking about how they use murals and, and uh, public art to reclaim their space, that the music is an antidote to violence and the murals make public our message and legitimacy. It was this way with the armed groups who would use walls to mark their territory and tell everyone how to behave. We are reinterpreting the walls for liberation and peace. Another mural about love. And some of the data we found really supports this incredible and positive change. What, a reduction in uh, the red there, you're seeing reductions in, in uh, homicides over a 10 year period. And unfortunately there's an increase in heart disease and respiratory illness. So it's an incomplete project for sure, Medellin and uh, all healing and healthy cities are an ongoing, ongoing process. Last example from Nairobi, Kenya in East Africa. Uh, again, a place where uh, our group has been partnering with community organizations and local government for over a decade, trying to both uh, do research, but plan and, and implement new projects to change living conditions, including housing and infrastructure and environmental, uh, reducing environmental risk. This is a typical street in a neighbor, in a community called Makuru, uh, in one of the largest informal settlements in Nairobi. And you can see the, the self-built shacks and roads and uh, self-wired electricity. That's all informal, um, 
the elected officials call it illegal, community residents call it informal, and they rely on this to survive. This is a, also a, a street in Makuru that's, uh, as you can see, subject to flooding and um, a major risk. There's been cholera outbreaks and really uh, climate induced risks have increased flooding and vulnerability in this community. And part of that response was community mobilizing to say, we don't want to be evicted. We want to be, have the right to remain here, but to improve our living conditions. Um, this is an area that's in walkable proximity to jobs, and informal a work that many of the urban poor rely on and very close to the center of Nairobi. This is Doris. She's one of the leading activists in Moku and she uh, really worked with our team to understand the risk, particularly to women around unsafe sanitation and toilets, which was a major concern for her and thousands and thousands of women who faced um, this kind of toilet uh, and sanitation, unsafe, particularly at night with no locks and no lighting and widespread sexual violence and, um, and insecurity for women and a whole host of practices that they were forced to engage with to cope with this lack of you know, basic sanitation and safe toilets. So Doris and her team mobilized young people and other women. And we worked with the uni local university and our UC Berkeley team to map every toilet in Makuru. And this is a map that you're seeing of, uh, that we put together with public, private and shared toilets. What we highlighted among many other things is this everyday emergency in a community like Makuru and many other similar informal settlements, unfortunately, that there were between 1,600 and 67 people per toilet in this community. Now the sphere humanitarian standard, which is what the UN and um, emergency agencies rely on to rebuild a, um, in an emergency, say after an earthquake or a fire or a, a flood, uh, a temporary camp or displaced people, what do they rely on? Say how many people per toilet? And that standard is 20, people maximum per toilet. So the everyday emergency that this community faces uh, was just a violation, not only of international human rights standards, but also the Kenyan constitution. So Doris and her team mobilized women to file the first civil action uh, lawsuit against the Kenyan government for a right to healthy and safe sanitation. This was some press coverage of that lawsuit that was been going on for, for a while, for many years, but part of that settlement now what we talk about in the book is that uh, that work really came together to uh, into something called the Makuru Special Planning Area and Integrated Development Plan. So really looking at multiple risks, multiple traumas in this community and an upgrading plan to change those conditions, not just women's risk and sanitation, but roads and water and housing and social programs and education and healthcare and a whole host of things. And I don't know if it was luck or what, but as COVID hit, the Kenyan government decided that to avoid you know, an outbreak, they were gonna invest. And they looked at our plan and Doris's work and began doing investments, major investments in this informal settlement called Makuru. And this was some of the more recent uh, press coverage. Um, and the Nairobi, Metropolitan Services, kind of their city government development agency said that by next March, no slum in the city will be without roads, sewer lines and water using these plans that community generated. A national program called the National Hygiene Program was implemented uh, starting in last year, employing youth to clean up and help rebuild the, the community, paving roads, drilling wells, uh, installing uh, hygienic toilets that are connected to the sewer, doing flood control along the river and ecologic services, ecosystem services like tree planting uh, and a whole host of other things, including now a program to build 13,000 units of social housing uh, in the informal settlements. So development hopefully without displacement as residents get to stay and benefit from their own plans and their own research that led to this to these plans. And now just a few weeks ago, uh, the UK Guardian published uh, an article about how what's happening in Maku may be a model for informal settlement upgrading and healthy and healing redevelopment uh, in informal settlements across Africa and potentially across the world. So I'll wrap up 
um, about some of, of this work and happy to have a conversation and engage with questions uh, about the importance of what does Cities for Life mean? What does it mean for communities to help recover from trauma and rebuild for health? Well, first is they communities are experts themselves. They, we need to value their knowledge and expertise and professionals, policymakers, international organizations need to figure out how to work better with communities, not on or for them. We need to continue to focus on these toxic stressors, these traumas, again, in our built and social environments to identify them and reduce those traumas and stop focusing just on one disease or risk factor at a time, which really has not changed significantly enough the dynamic in many communities. This idea of urban acupuncture, whether it was in Richmond or Medellin, of focused equity projects, investments that support both people and places uh, can kind of have a reverberating effect on the entire city and the entire community. This work is not um, static. We need to learn as we go um, and pay residents, support them, economic benefit initially with their ideas and with their labor to rebuild their own communities. Uh, be, be active participants in that healing uh, is really critical uh, and evaluate and adjust as we go. So we need to measure what's working and what's not. And I think all of this contributes to a new way to think about cities and urban planning and urban policy, particularly a new science uh, for and with cities and, and communities. Um, and to stop relying too much on abstract data and models and work more closely with communities and their real lived experience and center their ideas and their knowledge uh, in our increasingly data centered, um, you know, more and more complex uh, systems to really think about how policies and our plans can most support those that are already vulnerable to help them recover today and be more healthy tomorrow. So I'll stop there, thanks. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, wow, and the stories that he's sharing with you today just really are um, the tip of the iceberg for what's in the book. Um, there's just so much rich detail about all these stories in the book. Um, so just a reminder to the audience to um, go ahead, You know, think of your questions. What do we need to know to, um, to achieve similar outcomes here in the Valley or the places where you're living? Um, what do we need to know about process, outcomes, possibilities, barriers? So um, put those into the Q&A, Lauren will be collecting them. Um, just to get started, I always have questions. So um, the, the most pressing one I think for me is just, you wrote this book in 20, or this book was published in 2021. So you were writing it during the pandemic. So just wanted to hear a bit about how the, pandemic affected your creative process with this book um, and whether writing it during a pandemic shaped the book in any way. I mean, you write a lot about collective, you know, the sense of collective responsibility and action. And I think we've been talking about that a lot more during the pandemic. So interested to hear your thoughts on that, Jason. Yeah, Deidre, thanks. And for sure, the pandemic had an impact um, well, on all of our partners, and I'll, I'll give some specific examples, but uh, on myself in terms of the, the, the writing, yeah, I mean, it, it, it derailed it, it slowed it down, it, it kind of, um, the book was a, a kind of, um, you know, in slow motion project that eventually said, uh, okay, I've got to get, get this out. And um, like I said, it's been somewhat of a synthesis of, of a decade or more of work in each of these cities that I talk about. Um, you know, like I said, interestingly, for example, in Nairobi, the one of the chapters starts out talking about their response to COVID in that uh, early on, right, we wanted to ensure that folks had water to, to wash, uh, to, be, to, to avoid exposures, or uh, if they were going to social distance, which is very hard in an informal settlement, uh, and they're also informal laborers, which means they, if they don't work that day, they don't Get, eat that day because they don't have money. Um, so we actually, um, you know, documented and in, 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 in the chapter talk a lot about how community really understood how to identify the vulnerable, most vulnerable households, even within a highly vulnerable place. They created, um, you know, access to water right away through, you know, putting uh, just kind of jerry cans and 55 gallon drums of, of clean water out there for people to use to wash in places that didn't have access to free water um, and identified places to isolate. It turned out that thankfully uh, 
the uh, COVID did not hit in a, in a major way in places like Nairobi, but they were mobilized and prepared. Uh, I think, you know, in many ways through part of what I talked about with the work of Doris and the mapping to really understand their community. They were mobilized. They were working together. Uh, that helped the initial response to COVID. Now that also got in the way to a lot of the work that was happening in Richmond. So for example, uh, James, James Houston and the Office of Neighborhood Safety and this work of what they're calling advanced peace now of, of doing street outreach, of course, was completely shut down. So those, those relationships were significantly interrupted, uh, which you know, now we're hearing a lot about um, spikes in violence in, in many urban communities. Not only people have been um, you know, uh, deeper, deeper impoverished, they're also from often lockdowns, feeling the mental health strain of that. Uh, and we're seeing uh, the stress most likely uh, be resulting in, in uh, things like uh, suicides and use of guns uh, in many communities. Now, the ONS guys are out there on an everyday basis, getting in the middle of those kinds of conflicts. And when during COVID, when they couldn't, I think part of that is what we're seeing, particularly in the communities where they've been operating and, and other similar kinds of programs around the United States, where we're seeing this unfortunate rise in, in violence. So COVID, uh, you know, had a a mixed response in different parts of the world. And I think it's important to, again, recognize the context, but in all places, the importance of having already existing social connections, organizing people working together was critical to identify vulnerable people and populations and places um, and to think about the recovery and response uh, as people were able to get back together. Fantastic. Um, thanks for th sharing that, Jason. Yeah, and I think your response um, in, in the story in the book about Makuru really demonstrates how investing in that social infrastructure early on um, can help a community, you know, cope with crisis, you know, as it as it happens, as they happen. So we have a whole bunch of questions actually in the Q and A, which is great. So to start, we have an audience member who wants to know more about how you're defining trauma, which is the central concept in your book. Um, so please share the exact definition of trauma that you use or the literature on trauma that you're drawing from. Yeah, good question. So I mentioned Vessel van der Kook's uh, The Body Keeps the Score in the presentation. That's been a work on trauma that's been very influential in my thinking, uh, but also understanding um, you know, really the, the, the trauma that moves beyond just the clinical definition and to think about trauma as things that disrupt our ability to be together uh, and to, to get along and to function, you know, to kind of have a, to be able to make decisions every day. Um, I think that the definitions, which I'll point the person asking the question too in the book really also come, there's no one definition of trauma that I think I use, but I, I focus as much on trauma as on this idea of toxic stress. And the literature of moves, uh, asks us to move beyond just sort of uh, what's uh, positive stress. So there can be things that are um, healthy in our lives that give us some stress, but when we have the resources to manage those, whether they're relationships or economic resources, um, it can be uh, positive for us and we can grow and learn from that. There's tolerable stress. That's a, um, an idea where, uh, you know, the, we have really adverse life events, but we're able again to manage it and to, and to mitigate that stress because we have resources, both often economic uh, or physical, we can leave that stressful situation. Uh, or we have people to help us out. And that could include people, therapists, or going to your meditation or your yoga class. Of course, not everybody has that opportunity. But the trauma, the ongoing trauma is really from toxic stress. And that's the unmitigated chronic stress that often is out of our control. It's not something we can meditate our way out of. It's not something we can necessarily uh, change because these things are in our living conditions as well as in our um, uh, in, in our often interpersonal uh, environments. They can be in the institutions we're forced to engage with, our school systems, our transportation systems, our housing systems. Um, and so they often, uh, that trauma is um, 
unrecognized often. And of course, a major trauma is, uh, uh, is racism and the ongoing racism, structural racism often, not just the interpersonal, which is uh, of course traumatic, but also the structural inequalities uh, that um, neighborhoods and, and communities are living with uh, is an ongoing major trauma. So these overlapping, uh, that's what I mean by chronic uh, insults lead to this toxic stress and then the biologic impacts of that. Uh, so, so that's where I'm really coming from in terms of uh, trauma. Thanks, Jason. Um, so we ha now have a question from a planning practitioner who's over here, um, Bonnie Richardson, who's a principal planner with the city of Tempe. And she wants to know a little bit more about the details with implementation. So three related questions. How did you go about paying people in the US projects? Was that done by a city or by a nonprofit? And how do we implement that locally? Yeah, okay. So. I guess in the implementation and US project really would be um, focused on Richmond, California. And I didn't talk a lot about many, many other things that were happened there, including um, injecting health and equity into uh, a general plan update. Uh, and then a strategy called health and all policies, which really made the city commit to a kind of um, addressing toxic stress, but also an anti-racist set of policies and an anti, uh, racism um, lens uh, an evaluation for all public policies in the city. Now, how to so part of the commitment is um, well, part of implementation is is a renewed political commitment. I think what we've seen, for for example, in COVID, is that it's not about money in many many communities. There are resources out there, but when we wanted to find, uh, you know, in California, they were buying hotel rooms or renting hotel rooms for the homeless. All of a sudden we were able to find resources uh, to house unhoused folks. Uh, or when we wanted to find emergency resources to buy more food than just what the meager food stamps and uh, EBT and other things were giving folks to survive because they were out of work, uh, cities and counties found the money to do that. So I think the, first of all, I think it's, it's recommitting to our pri being explicit about the priorities. Uh, part of what made some of the Richmond work go is that some of the projects uh, and the workers became city employees. So part of the lesson, I think, and what we see also in Medellin is that the work cannot happen only on the backs of nonprofits or depend on foundation, private philanthropy, volunteers alone. That's not going to change these structural inequalities and really get to true healing. Uh, when you want to have peacemakers in your neighborhood every day, uh, engaging with young people who are disconnected from every system. They need to have the security of employment and they themselves need to have well-paying jobs uh, that other people in you know, every city agency gets. Uh, we did some analysis that showed how much police officers make uh, and what are these folks who are out there uh, doing work that maybe police thought they could do but they really can't because they don't have the trust and credibility to. Uh, and it's just, you know, the policing budget is often the major, the major budget of public safety is often the biggest expenditure for almost every city. So rethinking and redistributing maybe some of those resources to keeping peace and investing in this as an ongoing project. Now, the Pogo Park uh, employees uh, were funded uh, by private philanthropy, by foundations who, who funded that work. Uh, but you know, they didn't just hire outside consultants, they trained re community residents who had no experience in whether it was construction or park management or project management to do the work. Now that was a major commitment they made uh, and they continue to, to hire tens of tens of people and invest millions back into the neighborhood by paying local people to not just build it one time, but to maintain it. And again, uh, I think we need to rethink our city services about who's doing this work. Uh, lots of evidence that when communities that have been traumatized and faced disinvestment over many generations get an opportunity to help rebuild their communities and get paid to do it. That's a part of participating in the healing process. Uh, and they you know, can reconstruct and redesign and, and maintain their places in ways that help them and, and other 
community residents uh, heal and importantly, get economic benefit from that. So it was a combination of both a city municipal commitment to hiring people in an ongoing way uh, and uh, private philanthropy resources to pay people in the Richmond cases. Yeah, and Jason, and you were hitting at, at this in your um, comment, but you know, in order to um, create these cities for life that you talk about, we do need to rethink the way that we govern in this very deep way, you know, this non-superficial way. And I think the it's the health um, in all policies, this this tool, or well, it, it's actually a comprehensive strategy or an approach that's being used in Richmond is really inspirational. And so I highly recommend um, if you're a practitioner, take a look at this strategy and, and think about whether it's something that, that would make sense here. Um, so another question for you, um, you know, so in the United States, right, we have this kind of trope of, of the, you know, rugged kind of individualist, right? You know, the cow, cowboy on the frontier, you know, so you know, this culture of individualism really permeates within the United States. And so, you know, this creates challenges when we're thinking about, um, you know, acting in this collective way or building this sense of collective responsibility. So a question, how do you recommend getting buy-in from government, leadership, elected officials to take this more community-centered approach, to move away from this individual, you know, competitive approach that I think permeates local government? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think um, part of what I've seen is that when you actually listen and get inside communities, there's a lot of collaboration already happening, but it's often not maybe in the spaces you may typically look if you're a city council member or uh, you know a, a government official. So you know often faith-based groups or youth, young people are coming together often uh, both because they're looking for opportunities to come together. Um, but also because they need spaces to call their own and to heal uh, and to define it themselves. So involving you know young people is a really critical thing that for planning the future uh, of our communities and to think about what do we need to heal from existing inequalities. Uh, often, you know that's what we're trying to do in in Richmond. That's what has been happening in um, in in Medellin and in Nairobi for sure. So. Um, you know, I have found that that planners and council members, uh, they say, well, people, you know, they don't want to participate. Or, well, often you may be looking in the wrong place. And secondly, the structure of the opportunities to participate is broken. I mean, if we just have a council meeting where people can come and make a three minute or five minute statement and there's no constructive dialogue, there's no way of kind of engaging in the nuance of what do we need and, and who whose voices are being marginalized and, and not? Why are there you know, 10 people being paid by a developer to line up in front of everybody else before anybody else can comment? Uh, I mean, those, those are, are things that planners and policymakers can, can um, use their discretion to, to do differently, but we just have not seen that level of commitment uh, to look for collaborative processes in many, many communities. So I would say, you know, look, Look at, at yourself, look at, at the structures of, of opportunity for engagement and participation. Look out in un, unconventional spaces where young people, uh, folks who are undocumented, folks who have been marginalized, you gotta get out and listen in multiple languages uh, and make yourself uncomfortable. Uh, and I think you'll find collaboration. Yeah, I mean, you talk about the social infrastructure, it's not just important to have within communities, but between communities and local governments. And so I think you have a, a lot of um, ideas on how to build that in the book uh, through these cases. So we have a question uh, now hopping over to Nairobi in the Makuru case study about the nuts and bolts of some of the work that was being done there. So the question is, um, slum dwellers in other countries have had challenges moving from a ground floor living situation into a multi-story structure. How did Nairobi authorities get feedback on the design of their new housing structure? Yeah, so that that's a still a challenge in, in Nairobi for sure, because as you know, as the questioner or the uh, you know, as notes, living on the ground floor, being able to sell something or have a business right out of your ground floor st structure is um, an economic advantage. So a couple of things have happened. First of all, in the case that I talked about, they're now building 
some of the housing and it's uh, mostly uh, being government built housing. The community is building and designing and getting paid in, in many cases for the infrastructure and the environmental projects. Um, there's, there hasn't, they're still negotiating that, uh, you know, how many floors to go up. But what they're often doing is um, at the community's request is the ground floor becomes market stalls that people who live on the second, third uh, story above can utilize so that it becomes um, a market space uh, or a space for a daycare center or other kinds of um, needs in the community that are actually already happening um, rather than just being unique to that one family or that one household. So it becomes more of a shared uh, communal cooperative in many cases. So the villages or the neighborhoods um, define a lane or a street um, that gets improved and how those ground floor uh, front stalls facing the street will be used. Um, and they often develop a management system. In fact, that's a key part of the lesson from Nairobi is you can build the water and the sanitation and the housing, but if you don't actually have a, a management system that's accountable to people to ensure that people can still get that service if they don't work or can't pay, uh, or that they can, there's some flexibility uh, in that. For example, people may wanna rent out their part of their room or their structure. So do they have a separate entrance where they can rent a room and still live in a front room, things like that. These were all design solutions and ideas that came from community residents. When government and architects and engineers from uh, development agencies, from the central government to the World Bank to everybody else said, we can do this and we can do it quickly, the designs and projects did not meet the local needs. Um, so that, that was part of the pushback, but uh, it's still a challenge. I think that it's a great question. Um, and the, the challenge is really to ensure that there's livelihoods in addition to living spaces. And that's what um, housing advocates have not focused enough on in informal settlements is they focused on getting people housed in structures, but not the living conditions, or, or sorry, the, the, the uh, the livelihoods that need to support that. You need to pay your rent. Uh, you need to continue to have that economic opportunity. Uh, and these are very vibrant, as you likely know, economic places. I mean, in Nairobi, the informal sector is about 65% of the total economy of that city. So it's not a marginal part, it's a central part. Um, so really preserving that and lifting it up and then making it safer and more dependable and reliable for folks is really a critical part of the upgrading process. So we have um, a couple of folks who want to engage more with your concept of uh, urban acupuncture, which was pretty central in that uh, Medellin case that you talked about. This idea of, you know, focusing on the pressure points, the pain points, the the poorest communities first, and putting, you know, the most beautiful, impactful projects in those places first. Um, and so, a couple questions on that. First, how do we continue um, and, and connect? How do we continue urban acupuncture? How do we connect it to this national conversation about quote human infrastructure? Yeah, so urban acupuncture. You know, Jaime Lerner from Brazil, you know, uh, talked a lot about this before his he passed away. But in, um, so it's not a new idea. Uh, importantly, it's again as I'm trying to emphasize focused on process as much as product. So it's about um, a, an engagement participatory process of folks who have been marginalized and not centered in the design and planning process, coming up with those catalytic projects. Um, and then again, being part of the implementation uh, of those, because that's actually where the, the stimulus comes from is when not just you build something beautiful, but local people are part of that and they work it and they, you know, uh, so in Medellin, they're building beautiful community centers and schools, but local people are working there. They're the teachers, they're the social workers, they're the uh, folks who are actually, um, you know, occupying in some ways that space and delivering those benefits to the broader community. And that's part of the, the, the catalytic nature of urban acupuncture is it's not an architecture, urban design process alone. It has to be a process of, uh, you know, uh, collaboration and co-creation and then implementation uh, and ensuring that folks are, are benefiting uh, from, from those, those projects. And the idea is that um, 
you know, what city in the world would build their most beautiful museum or library in the poorest, most violent neighborhood? Uh, none un until they look at Medellin and that's what they did. Uh, they built the most beautiful and functional and serving the local community. It wasn't as if, okay, the poor and the folks in the, in, in the barrios couldn't access those facilities, but they could, it was theirs. Uh, it was for them also, in addition to now tourists and people from outside the community coming there. So, you know, there's danger in some of that in terms of uh, displacement and other things. Uh, but what we've seen in, in Medellin is, is that that's been a critical part of this catalytic uh, process. Um, you know, if you look at the urban acupuncture in New York City, all the, you know, most innovative design and functional stuff is happening in Manhattan and downtown Manhattan. It's not happening in the South Bronx. It's not happening in Brownsville, Brooklyn. It's not happening, uh, you know, in, in, in poor parts of Queens where it's needed the most. Uh, so that's the difference, I think, of, you know, looking at this urban acupuncture approach uh, from Latin America. So uh, a comment and a question also somewhat related to urban acupuncture. So the comment from this audience member is, I specifically struggle with communicating to the individual who is the hero in their own story and the reluctance of governments to acknowledge their own role in being a villain and, and how to motivate you know, coalitions for change making. So the question is, do you offer any examples of working beyond the urban acupuncture scale and um, partnering with those at the top of government who may defend systems that shape the environmental context that works against community empowerment? So thinking from the kind of scale of urban acupuncture to this more broader sy systemic scale um, within governance. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, yes and no. So it kind of depends. But in all the examples, there has been engagement on and off engagement with, you know, folks in power at, at higher scales, all the way from the municipal scale to, you know, a, a state or regional government to national governments, to international organizations as well, um, particularly in, in the Nairobi uh, example, but in all the cases. But a lot of that engagement is not driven by, by me, it's driven by whether the community partners and community members feel like they're being listened to and, and valued and their input or ideas are, are uh, being you know, meaningful when they wanna talk about the history and of the structural inequalities and so, you know, Richmond acknowledging, uh, for example, redlining and how that has segregated neighborhoods and those neighborhoods like the Iron Triangle remain spatially cut off from access to other parts of development that happened over years. And to make that explicit and to address that, you mentioned Deidre, the health in all policies strategy. Uh, that's where some of that history and some of that context of larger scale calling out government uh, for things that they continue to do that's traumatic, that uh, adversely impacts people has to happen. So in Nairobi, when the county government, the city, Nairobi is a city county government, when they were uh, participating uh, with the Makuru residents to do some of this upgrading, there was real meaningful engagement, regular meetings, dialogue. Um, but then there was a moment where they started to, uh, they said they wanted to build a new highway uh, that connected uh, disparate parts of the city and they said, okay, well, let's build it right through this Makuru and we'll start displacing people. And in the middle of the night, they came in without notice and started displacing people. So that's when the confrontation of organizing and lawsuits and protests had to happen. So it's not an either or, yes, we work with government or high level uh, power brokers or no. Uh, I think it, in, in all the cases, it, it, it really depends. And uh, of course, like I said earlier, the, the radical change that needs to happen to reverse centuries or more of poor policy, inequalities, racism, and discrimination and segregation can't happen on the backs of nonprofits or community members alone. They need to be leaders, but their resources of government need to follow um, their lead. Thanks, Jason. Um, so one last question for you, and I'm actually going to use my privilege as a moderator to ask the last question. And this is a question I had throughout the entire book. 
So in the book, you make this strong argument for, you know, uh, the, the need to restructure the way we govern in order to create, you know, healthy places, cities, bring about equity and justice and all these things that we're talking about now. Um, and you provide so many details on how to do that in the book. And I really appreciate that. From the education side, though, I kept wondering about the way we're training urban planners, um, folks going into public policy, and I wondered, is a similar kind of restructuring needed in the way that we're educating future planners, policymakers, and, uh, you know, administrators? And if so, you know, what, what might that look like? So I just wanted to provide you some opportunity um, to provide some guidance on, on this important topic. Yeah, thank you, Deidre, and you're reading my mind, yes. Um, yes to all of the above. Uh, it's no surprise that we keep reproducing inequitable outcomes in our government institutions because we're training people uh, to do that. Uh, we're not training them any differently. We're not preparing them to uh, think, to collaborate or to do differently. So that's a major problem. So yes, um, we need to get rid of the way we uh, ask graduate students, for example, to focus in on a very narrow specialty when they come into graduate school, like in planning uh, or public policy or public health, like, you know, I'm an infectious disease specialist or I'm an epidemiologist or I do transportation planning. No, you have to start, we have to start preparing people to, uh, to think about how we do problem solving training. So, you know, how do we address the traumas in neighborhoods? Uh, how do we reorganize our education institutions to be focused on climate injustice? How do we reorganize uh, the way we prepare people uh, to be listeners and collaborators with, not on communities? Uh, we're doing the exact opposite. We're going into a hyper ex, you know, specialized and expertise approach, you know, bigger and bigger data, more and more surveillance. For, and just by the way, that surveillance is almost disproportionately more on the poor and people uh, who don't have access uh, to that increasingly valuable information, but they're being told what to do based on all of that uh, modeling and data. So yeah, we need to rethink the way we organize um, our, our institutions and prepare uh, our students. And that has to start uh, at the undergraduate level, if not earlier. Um, we need to start to do more uh, what we do in planning and architecture and other disciplines, which are more collaborative kind of studio kinds of teaching, field-based learning. This is deep, deep in the history of public health, but almost every school of public health has um, turned that into a clinical rotation, which means just treat people or give them data or information and hope they listen to you um, without real meaningful engagement. So there's lots of things that we're thinking about and trying to do. Uh, I run a concurrent degree program at Berkeley where you get a master's in city planning and a master's in public health. There's uh, at least a dozen or more of those programs around the country uh, and in uh, Canada, some increasingly in Europe, but we're still preparing people to be much too narrow, to be much too specialized and not problem and equity focused. Uh, and that's problematic because the world is not narrow, uh, it's inequal, inequitable uh, and we need better collaboration. Wow, Jason. Well, um, thank you for that vision. Um, ASU folks, I think we're uniquely positioned to do this problem solving training that Jason's talking about. So let's carry that with us and, and think about how to do that. So we are just about at time. Um, so just a reminder to go out and get the book. It's fabulous. It's so readable. Lauren's going to place um, a link in the chat on um, how to buy it through Changing Hands, our wonderful local bookstore. Um, thank you everyone for the great questions. Thank you, thank you so much to Jason for sharing your time with us today and, and wishing everyone a, a happy holiday, a holiday, a holiday week. Bye everyone. Thank, thank bye you bye. everyone. Thank you.